Good evening, everybody. Good evening. We have a, a, a feast of a lecture this evening, so I'm going to uh, start, try to start on time. Uh, welcome to, to SOAS. Uh, my name is Scott Redford. I am the Nasr D. Khalili Professor of Islamic Art and Archaeology and the convener of the Islamic Art Circle. And as you know, this lecture is part of our, one of our series. During turn time, the Islamic Art Circle brings lecturers on Islamic art to SOAS. Um, uh, and uh, Professor Khalili kindly supports the Islamic Art Circle by sponsoring an annual lecture in memory of his uh, parents, for which we are very grateful. It's an honor to be welcoming David Khalili here uh, this evening. He will be discussing, of course, the art of collecting. Professor Khalili, as many of you will know, is a world-renowned scholar, collector, and philanthropist who has been called the cultural ambassador of Islam by leaders of Muslim countries. Since 1970, he has assembled eight of the world's finest and most comprehensive art collections, Islamic art, Hajj and the arts of the pilgrimage, um, Aramaic documents, Japanese art of the Meiji period, Japanese kimonos, Swedish textiles, Spanish damascene metalwork, and enamels of the world. Together, the eight collections comprise some 35,000 works of art. The Khalili collections will be fully represented in a series of 88 books, including exhibition catalogs, of which 70 have already been published. These eight collections have been shown in over 40 major museums worldwide. <laughs> Furthermore, the Khalili collections have been major contributors to more than 50 international exhibitions. Selections from the eight collections have been exhibited in museums such as the British Museum, the Victoria and Albert Museum, the Hermitage in St. Petersburg, the Alhambra Palace in Granada, the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, and the list goes on. David Khalili is a graduate, associate, research professor, and honorary fellow of the University of London, and was the longest serving governor of our university. In the early 1990s, he was solely responsible for securing 10 million pounds from his friend, His Majesty the Sultan of Brunei, to build this uh, magnificent building in which you find yourselves this evening. He is also an honorary fellow of Wilson College, a member of the Chancellor's Court of Benefactors, University of Oxford. And in 2003, he received the honorary degree of Doctor of Humane Letters from Boston University. In May 2005, he received an honorary doctorate from the University of the Arts in London. At Oxford, uh, David Khalili has sponsored the foundation and the running of the Khalili Research Center <coughs> for the Art and Material Culture of the Middle East. Professor Khalili has been awarded many other honors, including trustee of the city of Jerusalem, and in 2007, the High Sheriff of Greater London Award for his cultural contribution to London. He is exceptional in having received knighthoods from two popes. His Holiness, the late, Paul, uh, the late Pope John Paul II, honored him as Knight of the Pontifical Equestrian Order of St. Sylvester, and His Holiness, Pope Benedict XVI, further elevated him to knight commander in the same order for his work in the pursuit of peace, education, and culture amongst nations. In 2012, he was further honored in this field by UNESCO by being made a go goodwill ambassador. In 2014, he was the recipient of the Laureate of the Dialogue of Cultures Award of the French National Assembly. And in early 2016, he was uh, awarded the rank of officier in the Ordre National de la Légion d'Honneur by the French President François Hollande at the Élysée Palace. Thank you for your patience, and I would now like to pass you over to our special, very special guest speaker at tonight's Islamic Art Circle Lecture. Please join me in welcoming Professor David Khalili. Thank you very much, Scott, uh, and thank you for your uh, very generous introduction. Uh, I just wish that uh, my dear parents were here to hear it too. We are very old-fashioned in a way we run our life, and in the world of collecting, I always consider myself never ever as owner, but only as a temporary custodian, because at the end of the day, 
the ownership is nothing but a myth. When I started to collect, I realized that religion and politics always have their own languages. But the language of art is universal. This universality penetrates its message through the heart and mind of people. It is the best and probably the most secret weapon we have against today's world, which is extremely complex. Nobody can label you to collect something. Nobody ever label you to be a contributor. Nobody would ever accuse you to do something which is contribute to humanity and adds something and takes a bit of pain from the world that we live in today. We are living in a world of mass information full of misinformation. And this is the problem that the politics and the religion have. But art does not have that problem. What I'm going to do tonight is to run you through what we have done for the last 45 years, why I collected Islamic art, why I collected Hajj, material belonging to Hajj. As we go through, I, tr I try to put you on a fast track. You don't expect me to talk about 35,000 pieces in 45 minutes or one hour, obviously not. But I have cherry-picked certain pieces would somehow have a voice as ambassador of that section be it Islamic or a Hajj or the other collections. The word collector is a very tall order. People take this very loosely. Uh, I always say that uh, to be respected as a collector, you have to collect, you have to conserve, you have to research, you have to publish, and you have to, you have to exhibit your holding. Because if you don't do this, you do, if you don't fulfill these five criteria, you are not really doing anything for anybody. There are many selfish collectors around, and there are only few that share their passion with the public. From time to time, I'm asked by friends that uh, I live in the past, and I kindly turn around to them and say, no, I don't. I don't live in the past. I live with the past because we can learn a tremendous amount from the past. So I'm going to run through uh, here you see the eight collection as you go from left to right, uh, Islamic, Hajj, Aramaic, Japanese, kimono, Swedish textile, Spanish metalwork, and the last one is enamel of the word. <coughs> Islamic starts from the time that Prophet Muhammad was given the revelation in Mecca. He was born in 570, and he was chosen to be given the revelation when he was 30 years old. Majority of these revelation came through written messages that you see. These are the earliest one. Obviously, the word of God that was revealed to the prophet never changed in his content. But in form, it did change. And you see it as we go along. These are the earliest. This page is one of the earliest that we know. There are not many around, but you see it in some of major museums. Here and there is called Mayel because the writing goes through the left. Kufik was written on different type of vellum, blue, gold on white, pink, and on white. So sometime you see a vellum page and you realize that on one side, the writing has stayed very firmly, but on the other side, it's fading. Uh, the reason is very simple, because they use the skin. And the side of the skin that hair was growing is the side that somehow uh, the, uh, have a more penetration of the ink. And the other side is very smooth. 
So that is why sometimes you see on one side it's a bit uh, faded and on the other side it's not. So here I'm showing you four different types of Kufic, uh, Kufic writing. There are not many uh, complete Kufic uh, uh, Qurans around. Uh, we bought this uh, in 1980 uh, at uh, Christie's, I think it was. Uh, it's complete, it's a small, but it's a complete uh, the Kufi Quran. It's, I think, missing one page. Uh, I was talking to Jeremy just beforehand, uh, wondering uh, where are the other complete uh, Kufi uh, Qurans. And except in Egypt uh, and in Morocco, and I think in Mashhad in, in, in Iran, uh, there are not that many. Uh, I think uh, we could count them on our two hands when it comes to the small Kufi, Kufi Qurans. Uh, here I decided to... Um, uh, bring you a little story and show you a uh, story of uh, Timur uh, Tamerlane, who in um, 14th century, early 15th century, uh, decided to challenge his calligrapher. And he told him, why don't you surprise me? Write a Quran. So Omar Akta, who apparently, legend, legend says he was left-handed, uh, surprised uh, uh, Timur and walked in with the Quran, which was as small as it could take this, the, the place of this stone on his ring. So he looks at him and says, all right, I reward you, but I challenge you now to go and write the biggest Quran in the world. He goes back, and the story says that he walked in after a couple of years and brought the Quran on a wheelbarrow, wheelbarrow in, 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 into his palace. The line you see upstairs is one line from the main seven line pages that exist. And the one on the bottom is a copy that was made probably in uh, 19th century. We are very lucky to have two pages. So that is how the pages looked. And on the top, that is the pages that you see, which is from the main pages that was written during that period. I made a small discovery when I was in Washington. Uh, I went to see the Quran uh, exhibition in Washington. It's a fantastic exhibition. And I realized that uh, the stand for that Quran is a still exists in the mosque in Samarkand. And the photograph of it was there. So uh, I asked Julian to take a photograph and share it with you today. So that is the stand that was made for that Quran. Apparently, it was photographed in. Uh, uh, 1659 by a photographer. Uh, I didn't have the name, but uh, at least now you know that this is a, the, the stand that held that uh, huge Quran. There are not many uh, royal Quran that has been commissioned by a royal king. Uh, what you see here is um, a Quran commissioned by Shah Tahmas, and we are extremely lucky to have his royal seal with it. Uh, the story goes that, uh, uh, and by the way, it does have the handwriting of Shah Jahan because it ended up uh, to be in his uh, library in, uh, in India. So uh, the, 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 the Mughal and the Persians at the time were very close to each other. We shouldn't forget that almost simultaneously there were th three uh, the Persian, uh, the Islamic uh, kingdoms, which were uh, the Persians, the Ottomans, and, and, and the Mughals simultaneously, and they were very close to each other. So uh, this was given uh, by Shah Tahmas to, uh, to, 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 to uh, one of the uh, rulers. Uh, it's written in gold uh, throughout, and the surah headings are in uh, Lajivardina. Uh, in Iran, the Qajars decided that they want to take that to a next level. As I said, uh, the content of the Quran never changed, but uh, the writing, uh, the, the, the illumination, and the way, and the shape, and the size, and the way it was written in different type, Muhaqaq, Nas, uh, the, 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 the Nas Tariq, so there were different type of uh, Quranic writing. Uh, so the illumination during that period, during the Qajar period, was immense. Uh, this is uh, probably the largest uh, uh, Qajar Quran uh, that I know of. I brought this to show you for a simple reason. Uh, this is a royal uh, Quran written by the daughter of Zorang Aurangzeb, the son of uh, Shah Jahan. Shah Jahan himself was uh, very secular. I'll come to it in a minute later. 
But Aurangzeb was extremely, his son was extremely, extremely devout to, the, to Islam. And uh, uh, his, the, 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 the daughters were even more devoted to Islam. Uh, this Quran is written by uh, Aurangzeb's uh, daughter. Uh, the reason I wanted to share it with you is uh, there are some wrong impression about the role of uh, women in Islam. Uh, it's not really the fact. Uh, Muslims, uh, women were very respected in every period of history. Uh, even in Hadith, there is a story that uh, even Prophet himself used to ask his wife Khadija from, from, from time to time to ask him advice about what was going on in a household. So the role of the woman was, was extremely important in Islam. And from time to time, I always say that the world population is almost 7 billion, almost half of women and half of men. We should always remember that the mother of one half are the ladies. I was talking about uh, different type of, type of Quran, so I chose uh, four Qurans here for you to see. Uh, first of all, to see the different period and different type of writing. Uh, the first one is in three lines. The second one is one of two Jews that we know written by Yahut al Musasami, the great calligrapher of, uh, of, of, of Baghdad. Um, it has a signature saying, Katabaho uh, bi Madinat al Salam, which is Baghdad, and is dated 1282. Uh, it's funny that uh, almost 15 years later, in 1298, uh, he died. But there's a story about him, and that is why I chose that Quran, is very interesting because when the Mongols in, 19, in, in, in 1258 invaded Baghdad, uh, they knew about uh, Yahud. And, uh, the, and, and the, 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 Mongol, well, the Mongols at the time wanted to make sure that they captured him. So they told the soldiers, make sure that you capture him alive. We don't want you to kill him. So capture him and bring him alive. So the soldier used to go house to house and ask where Yahud was. And each time they said, who is Yahud al-Mustasami? Everybody put his hand up. <laughs> because they wanted to be saved. So in a very direct way, he saved a lot, a lot of lives. So that's a legend. The one on the bottom is the Spanish Quran. This is all the early, uh, one of the late uh, acquisition. Uh, we bought it about six, seven years ago. Uh, with the admission of all my friends who, who I meet, who I, from time to time they come to our center to look at our new acquisition, it's probably one of the finest uh, Spanish Qurans in the world. And the one on the right is um, a Mamluk Quran from Egypt. But the beauty of it is that it's written throughout in gold. You very rarely see Mamluk Qurans. We have many Qurans in our collection. We have about uh, 600 Qurans that covers geographically every major center of Muslim world, all the 53 Muslim countries. But what is important here is Quran and the ayat and the verses that was revealed to the Prophet is about 6,240. It is divided into 214 chapters. The person who was responsible for the Quran the way we see it today was the third caliph, not Abu Bakr, not Umar, it was Usman, who decided to take all the uh, revelation that was gathered and put them in the form we see today. There is a lot of discussion about that. We call Prophet Muhammad was uh, in Mecca for 10 years. So the revelation that was given to him are called Makki, Oya. And when he left and went to Medina for 13 years, the revelation in, Mac in Medina are called Madani. That means it comes from Medina. But what is important about the whole story is that when Usman decided to put the Quran the way we see it today, he used not the way that the, the, the revelation was given to Prophet Muhammad. He used mostly the Medina uh, the, the revelation, which were longer, and he used the shorter ones, which was given to Prophet in Mecca toward the end of the Quran. That's why when you look at the Quran, at the end of the Quran, you see a lot of surah heading uh, illumination. This is because the short ones ended up at the end. 
So the positioning of all the, the revelation was done by Usman, but the content stayed the same, and you see the changes in a form of illumination as we go along. The story of this piece is very interesting. Uh, uh, there was always a question that there is a Shah Jahan album, which is mostly miniatures, because as I said, he was very secular. But his son, uh, Aurangzeb, he put his father in jail, in actual fact, uh, was extremely, extremely, extremely devout to Islam. So um, the story was that uh, he asked uh, one of his uh, librarians to make an album for him of very special pages or saying or passages or ayat from Quran. So this album was prepared for him. It's absolutely magnificent. The pages are fully illuminated. Uh, I was in India and I was uh, having a tour of Taj Mahan and there was a guy who was with us and I asked him, uh, we know about the Shah Jahan album of miniatures, but we don't know about the album. Do you know anything about uh, him or Aqzib having an album? He said, no, this is all the stories. I came back from London. I was sitting behind my desk. It was a run, uh, rainy day. And uh, a good friend of mine, who I bought a lot of uh, objects from, Oliver Hoor, telephoned me and said, uh, David, you better come to see me. I haven't seen you for a while. I want you to come. I have something special to show you. Our other son, Daniel, was sitting next to me. And I said, Dan, let's go and see what Oliver has. If he's telephoning me, there is a reason. I walk in, and what, what he puts in front of me, he puts in front of me this album. I opened it, and at the first glance, I recognized Orang Zeeb's handwriting. So I knew that is his album. To, long, to, long, to cut the long story short, we bought it off him. And we, as, you, as, as, as you see here today, I'm, showing, I'm sharing it with you as an Orang Zeeb album. I'm showing you uh, now um, two pages from um, Sheikh Abdullah who was uh, extremely famous as he was one of the great calligraphers in the history of the uh, uh, Ottoman period. Uh, he lived uh, to uh, serve under uh, uh, two sultans, Sultan Salim and his son, Suleiman the Magnificent. The story goes that uh, one night uh, he was writing a uh, couple of pages. Uh, he was busy uh, in the middle of the night. He was, had the candle, the candle next to him, and he was writing, as you see, what, 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 what is on the screen. And uh, as he went to... Uh, put his um, pen into ink, he realized that somebody is holding the ink before him. He looked back, and it was the sultan who was holding the ink before him. So in haste, he turned around to him and said, uh, Your Majesty, this is a great honor for me to see you holding an ink well for me. And the legend says that the sultan turned around to him and said, No, the honor is mine. For as long as there are calligraphers like you, there would be many sultans who are holding the inkwell for you. <coughs> Obviously, Islamic art covers a lot of areas. Uh, we published so far about 20 volumes. And by the time we finish, hopefully by next year and the following year, it will be 37 volumes. And that would cover every medium of art. Uh, I'm showing you just some uh, Fatimid uh, uh, jewelry. We already published uh, our uh, jewelry collection. So this is just uh, two examples of uh, magnificence of um, uh, Fatimid period. Uh, India was uh, legendary for having, uh, because it was one of the wealthiest countries in the world, and the Mughals uh, were the lovers of uh, stones and enameling. Uh, on the left, you see uh, that beautiful falcon with uh, virtually pigeon blood uh, rubies and uh, beautiful flat diamonds, and a beak is a ruby too. Uh, and on the other side, you see probably one of the largest hookahs uh, that's or, or the only one that we know of. Uh, it's three and a half kilo of uh, enamel and gold. Uh, it's, it has been exhibited around the world in many of our exhibitions. Uh, I took the opportunity uh, to show you this because uh, there is an exhibition called uh, Power and uh, Protection in Ashmolium. Uh, it's ongoing. And on the left hand side, that's the cover of the catalog, which is uh, one of our pieces. It's a two hand of the Fatima that I'm showing you on the left, on the right hand side. Uh, it's probably earlier than uh, 18th century, we call it the 18th century, we want to be conservative. So um, if you have a chance, go and see that exhibition. It's a fantastic exhibition, and we are uh, a major contributor to it. It's virtually almost uh, have close to half of the objects come from us. I chose this because uh, I have a beautiful story to tell you behind it, and that's why you're here tonight, not only to look at the objects, to know some history behind it too. Uh, we were traveling, we were in France uh, with our family, and a friend of mine who is a 
buys only jewelry. It's his business is nothing else than buying jewelry. Telephoned me and said, uh, David, I bought something very important I wanted to see. I said, I'm traveling, so after I come back to London, I'll come and see you. So I would go and see him, and he turns around to me, put that in front of me. Obviously, I knew what it was, and he did, he did his research. He knew what it was. Uh, it's probably uh, the, the Shah Jahan period. It is uh, made out of uh, 93 uh, floorless Colombian emerald, which is shaped into what you see. It's not very big as you see. It's four, four centimeters by five centimeters. Uh, but it was sold at the pre-Columbian sale at Sotheby's. And he bought it for virtually nothing. He turned around to me and said, but I want X. I said, hold your horses. You can't ask 25 times more than we paid for. So he looked at me and said, I can. And you're going to pay for it. And we did. <laughs> <laughs> Again, that had been exhibited in many places. Uh, as, we, as you heard, uh, we uh, have an exhibition of our own that is only drawn from our own uh, eight collections, and we contribute to a lot of exhibitions around the world. This, is, this was the recent exhibition at Metropolitan Museum of Art. Uh, this casket, uh, I bought that in Christie's about 30 years ago. Uh, it has the combination lock is still uh, remnants of it on the, on the bottom of the lid. So um, without even telling me, they put uh, our piece on the cover of the uh, catalog of the Metropolitan. So uh, it is one of the rarest uh, metal work pieces in our collection. Uh, this came again from Oliver uh, almost 35 years ago. Uh, it's a pair of um, uh, door knockers. Each of them weighs uh, probably about 30 kilos, 25 kilos. Uh, as you see, the size is, is, is monumental. It's almost 40 centimeters by 35 centimeters. So, um, and again, from this period, they are uh, not that, that, there are not many metal works of that size and that caliber. The story of this is very beautiful too. Uh, in 1960s, a friend of mine, uh, a very good friend of mine, Hashim Khosravani, uh, who I bought a lot of miniatures and a lot of things from, I come to it uh, later, was traveling in Tehran. And there was a guy who was, uh, we call them samsars, uh, the guy who sells all sorts of things from one pound to whatever it is. He walks in and there is a heap of uh, Islamic objects in the corner of his uh, gallery. Uh, he looks and he sees the corner of this mask. He pulls it off and buys it for something like three or four dollars from him. Uh, and then he realizes uh, the importance of it. Uh, he brought it to London, and later on I purchased it from him. Uh, the similar piece to that was discovered or uh, excavated in Kiev, uh, and now it's in uh, St. Petersburg in Hermitage. Uh, that one is uh, probably uh, 13th century. This one, because of the design and the writing uh, on, a, on, on a front, on a, on a forehead of, of, of the mask, uh, we think that it is uh, Anatolia, and it must be uh, uh, from, 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 from Turkey. It's a, it's a major piece, and it has a lot of power when you look at it. Again, this story is very uh, relevant, too. Uh, there are only two gold saddles in the world, uh, and we went with the family when we had exhibitions in that part of the world uh, to pass uh, through China, because we had the exhibition in, in Australia. We went to the museum to see it. There is one in, uh, the, in the museum in, in China, in Beijing, and this is the second one. The one in Beijing is, uh, is not complete. Some part of it is missing. This is a complete one. Uh, gold was extremely, extremely, extremely expensive during that period. You're talking about 12th century. Uh, there are not many, uh, as I said, many gold saddles. There is this one and uh, the one in, in Beijing. So we are just proposing that that could have been, because of the significance of it, belonging to somebody very important, and we came up to say that it could maybe or perhaps could be a Chinggis Khan saddle. I chose that for different reasons too. Uh, we hear nowadays about uh, music to be forbidden in Islam. This is nothing but just a mirage. Uh, every caliph used to have musicians in their, in, their, in, their, in their palaces. They used to have them around them each time they came back from a war. Not only they had uh, musicians around them, they have figures. The, their palaces was full of figures. So all these ideas are man-made. It had nothing to do with what, what we see and the, the, the evidences we have. Uh, I chose that because um, you see the caliph sitting in the middle there, and the musicians are sitting around him. So it's Silver in Bay, and it's from, um, from Jazeera, or probably from Western Iraq. 
the Fatimid were uh, master of creating uh, incredible objects. You saw some of the, the uh, gold one I showed you, but uh, glass was against another forte of the Fatimid dynasty. Uh, there are not many intact one known. Uh, this was found uh, apparently wrapped in, 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 in a jar. Uh, we bought this about 40 years ago. It's absolutely intact and it weighs probably about 40 grams, 50 grams. It's absolutely as light as a, as, as a, as a feather. So I thought I would share that with you. Uh, our glass collection has been published, by the way. This is another piece, and the reason I chose it is because it has the name of the Sultan Barkuk. So we know when he reigned, which was about uh, 1385 or earlier, and his name is written on the top of the uh, mosque lamp. Doing my PhD in this university on Islamic lacquer, I thought I would share at least one piece with you. Uh, it's my home. Um, I, we lent that to the Indian exhibition at Metropolitan too. Uh, Rahime Dakani was a very famous and eminent uh, uh, maker of uh, pen boxes and a master lacquer painter. So uh, as you see, you can sometimes believe that pointism can be to that height, because if you blow these figures on, on the top of this pen box, and as you see, it's very small, to uh, one meter by one meter, it would look like a Renaissance painting. That shows you the strength, the ability, and the passion of these artists. We are extremely lucky to have uh, 10 Shah Tahmas pages called Hotan pages. I'm sure everybody knows about Hotan Shah Nama pages. Uh, according to Herald Tribune, when one of one was sold not long ago, it belongs to Carrie Welsh. They called it uh, one of the greatest relic of humanity, not as a Persian miniature. We own 10 of them, and we are lucky because Carrie Welsh, before the document, before the book, the Shahnameh was dispersed by, um, by Houghton, 85 of them are in, the, in, 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 in Iran, about the same number, 90 something are in Iran, the same number are in Metropolitan because it was given as a tax deduction. Uh, but before it was dispersed, uh, Carrie Welsh chose uh, 10 of the best, according to him. Uh, so these are the 10, which was bought by my friend Khosravani at the time. And uh, we were lucky to buy not only these 10 pages, this is one of them close up, uh, but we bought other uh, things from him too, uh, uh, including the mask and including a lot of other miniatures, which are coming in two volumes. We are being published uh, hopefully next year. So this is one of them. This is another one. Uh, I made a small discovery, and I hope I'm right. Uh, and if anybody disagrees in the audience with me, when we go to have our uh, Lebanese food, please uh, bring it to my attention. Uh, this is supposed to be um, uh, Faronak sending his son uh, some gifts from the treasury. I looked at it, and it shows a lot of happiness in these miniatures. And I realized that Nowruz is the feast of spring. And it's a, it's, it's a new year in Persia. So Nowruz means a new day. And the first, of this, the first day of spring is the first day of spring. This is when we're becoming nature, when we, when we welcome nature. So uh, even the camels are laughing. <laughs> so I decided that it must be a happy occasion, and it could be Nowruz. Now, if you disagree with me, come to me and challenge me. <laughs> now, uh, in, the, in my lecture from time to time, I, uh, uh, challenge uh, the audience. Uh, this is one of them. Uh, this is a miniature from Padishah Nameh. Uh, we have a page, and um, the majority of these are in the collection of Her Majesty the Queen. Uh, as you see on the top, uh, on top of the miniature, you see Shah Jahan sitting up there. This is this is almost as small as your nail on your small finger. All right. So if you blow this up to the size of what you see on a screen. Again, as I said, it would look like a, the, 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 the Renaissance painting. Again, that shows the strength, the ability of these artists. The story here is very uh, revealing too. Uh, uh, Rashid Uddin was a vizier of two rulers at the time of the Mongols. Uh, Ghazan Khan and uh, Ujjay II. At the age of 30, he was born as a Jew. At the age of 30, he converted and became Muslim because he wanted to become a vizier. 
he was given the commission to write the history of the world. He started to write the history of the world by the history of the, uh, of, of the Chinese. But then he expanded and did the history of the world from the time of Adam to the time, to his time. The sad story is, and I'm showing you the next one too, we owe two parts, there are only two parts that exist today out of most of these, uh, the, the, the books that was written by him, illuminated by his team in Tabriz, as sent throughout the kingdom at the time. Uh, one is in Scotland, and it is in uh, the, the, the library in Edinburgh, and this one belonged to Asiatic Society. In 1980, they decided to sell it. My friend the Hoshim bought it. At the time, it broke all the record. Uh, we had it uh, 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 conserved, because whenever we buy anything, the first thing we do, we conserve it. We don't hang around. So we conserved it. But the story doesn't end there. Uh, during the Ghazan Khan, he was a favor, favor, favorite of, 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 of the ruler. But when Ujartu came in, there was a conspiracy against him. They beheaded his son in front of him. They beheaded him too. And they turned his head on the top of a stick and paraded it around town. And they called him, this is the head of a Jew, even though he did so much for Islam at the time. But the irony is that almost 800 years later, a cousin of him, again, is the custodian of the peace that he commissioned to be written. Thank you. Pottery in Islam is legendary. Everybody knows about different pottery from different parts of the world. Uh, this piece uh, is a Lakhobi from Syria. As you look at it uh, at a glance, you say probably this is Picasso is a modern art. Uh, you don't consider it to be something Islamic. But that's not the story. The story is that that, was, that came up for sale in Paris. And I, I didn't have a chance to buy it. So a friend of mine, a dealer friend of mine bought it. And it was virtually painted all over, because it was broken in a few pieces. But because they wanted to uh, the, cover the, the cracks, they virtually uh, they repainted the entire piece. So I looked at the back of it. I bought it. We cleaned it in its totality, restored it. And not even one epsom is missing. It's only in four or five pieces, so we put it together. So that was a challenge. My father, when I was, uh, I think, nine years old, uh, sold this piece to a friend of ours who later on went to the United States called Habib Anovian. Um, it's a luster piece. It's intact uh, and extremely rare because intact uh, the, the potteries in Islam are not as uh, uh, plentiful as in other um, uh, uh, cultures. Um, we sold it to him, and I packed it for him when I was, I think, 10 years old. And he gave me a tip for packing it. Uh, <laughs> later on, uh, he decided, uh, when he got a bit older, that he would sell his entire collection. So he telephoned me. I flew to New York. I wrote the invoice for every single piece. And this is one of them. We bought about 50 pieces from him and uh, delivered them back home. So the piece that I packed and I got the tip for ended up in the collection at the end. Uh, in our Islamic collection, we have, uh, we have the, the, the book is coming out in, in two volumes uh, uh, this year. We have about uh, 320 uh, uh, carpets and textile. I chose uh, three for six different reasons. The first one is Ushak. Uh, that was in a collector, collection of a, a Swiss guy for about 120 years. Uh, we convinced him about 30 years ago to sell it to us. I went to Geneva and I bought it. It's probably the most perfect uh, Ushak carpet around. The one in the middle is even more interesting. Uh, I bought that from Michael Francis uh, a big gain about 35 years ago. And as I looked at it, I knew that that's a baby of the Ardeville corporate uh, at the VNA. Uh, so to prove to ourselves that it is it, what, what it is, when they were restoring uh, the one at the VNA, we took this one, we compared it, and it is definitely the same period, the same time, the same atelier. So it is the baby of the one at the VNA. The one on the right uh, is a textile of uh, 16th century. Uh, and I decided that, that uh, it cannot be just an ordinary piece of textile because the woman is wearing a crown. So in that period, there are not many ladies who were allowed to wear a crown. So amongst our friends, we are just 
assuming that that could be Shah Jahan's mother. We bought this piece uh, from Spink in 1974. I bought a lot of uh, textile from them. Uh, at the time, uh, Menard was there, God bless his soul, and Francesco was there, Francesco Galloway. So we bought uh, a, a group of textile, and I looked at this textile, which is extremely early, as you see, and I realized that majority of the illumination in the Qurans could have been inspired by this design, and this is why. So I chose four of our Qurans in our collections, and I chose, there are plenty more, but I chose uh, some of the surah headings just to, sh to, to, sh to show you that uh, inspiration is something that everybody benefits from. Uh, this piece has a story too. Uh, this is one of our textile pieces. Uh, as you see, it's silk and silk from Morocco, um, and it's, um, the background is uh, blue silk, and the name of Allah is uh, woven in silk, uh, in silk uh, silver thread into the, the, the green uh, silk. I had that in exhibition in Abu Dhabi when we had our big exhibition in Abu Dhabi, which was the biggest exhibition in the Middle East. And that was at the interest of the exhibition. So um, a couple of uh, artists came to me afterward and they said, would you allow us to copy this? I said, you could copy whatever you want. Inspiration is something that you have to, to, to follow. Art is timeless. Why not? Copy it. A year later, uh, I went back to Abu Dhabi because uh, I was interested to see what's going on. And I saw that copied on a black canvas. And you know how you make topping on a cake? So he just put some, some uh, paint, white paint, and put Allah, 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 Allah. So I said to him, you know something? I'm interested. I have the original. So why don't you send me this? He said, oh, it's sold. I said, oh, it's sold already. So out of interest, I said, how much for? He said, $900,000. I said, hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it. How much? He said, $900,000. I said, excuse me, I bought that piece 30 years ago for $5,000. What are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> that shows you. <laughs> um, uh, silk uh, uh, Mughal carpets are rare. Uh, we are lucky to have uh, this one. I wanted to share that with you. Uh, there was one at the Metropolitan Museum of Art uh, on loan for 80 years. And after 80 years, I think the heir of the, of the, of the people who uh, gave the, 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 the carpet approached Met. They took it from the Met and uh, sold it uh, to the government of Qatar. I wanted to buy it, but they paid me three or four times more than I was offering to pay. So good luck to them. Now, when I was in Abu Dhabi, uh, we, had, we had a seminar, and one of the speakers was me. And uh, I turned around for the first time, and I said, um, for the last 45 years, we have been buying uh, objects belonging to Mecca and Medina. Uh, one day we are going to, um, and we are going very in a process of writing uh, four volumes about the history of Hajj, called the Hajj, and the art of pilgrimage. Uh, I shared the idea. Benicia Porter was in the audience. I shared, uh, she came back to me. I shared the idea with her. We ended up uh, to give uh, this exhibition at the British Museum. Uh, as you see, the cover is the piece, one of our pieces. The exhibition was, majority of the pieces was from our collection. Um, I'm very sensitive toward uh, the object from the Hajj. We have about two and a half thousand pieces belonging to Mecca Medina. Uh, what you see here again is, is, is the panorama of Mecca, which was at the exhibition. Uh, but the, the importance of it is, it's the first eye view of Mecca ever painted because uh, the daughter of Aurangzeb sent his painter to sit down and paint Mecca stone by stone. The majority of what you see doesn't exist anymore. Photograph was started to be taken by uh, uh, Saad Bey in about 18, 1840, 1850. So it's about 40 years later that we have photograph of Mecca and Medina. But that's a real thing. But at the time, uh, this Saudi guy came up with the magnetic, uh, uh, this piece is uh, small, it's virtually nothing. Uh, and at the exhibition, a lot of people were appreciating it because he came up with the idea which was appealing. Uh, this is a Mamluk piece, probably uh, uh, early 14th century, 1320, 1310. It's a genealogy of the, of the Prophet. Uh, it starts with the name of Prophet Muhammad, and it runs through the, the next 40, 50 pages, and it covers the history of uh, Prophet from Adam to the, to, 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 to the given time at, 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 at the time. Uh, we do not know of uh, another genealogy of this period, of this quality. We bought that in Sadevi, that belonged to uh, a royal collection. 
I've been cheeky to do something else here. As you see, uh, you see Alexander the Great in Mecca. Yeah, you say to yourself, uh, but uh, that is 10th century BC. What is he doing in Mecca? But these are all, all the stories. And the legend goes that uh, Mecca was already a holy place even before Islam. So that is the argument. And uh, when, I was, uh, when we had the exhibition at the British Museum, uh, Neil McGregor came to me and said, uh, next time I do the 100 of the most important pieces in the world, I'm going to put that in it, because that has a message. I said, you're most welcome. Uh, we have about 350 textile belonging to Mecca and Medina. I'm sharing the earliest setara. As you know, every year they change the, 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 the setara in front of uh, the, the, the door of Kaaba. Uh, the sultans used to do that. It used to be made sometime in Egypt, sometime in Turkey. Uh, now the, 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 the place, the atelier that produces this in, in Saudi Arabia, it costs absolute and utter fortune. But the one that are produced now is not made, made out of uh, actual metal. These are silver woven. There is no uh, thread at all. Everything that you see, and they weigh almost 30, 40 kilos each of them. Uh, the one on the right, nobody knew about what Mahmal was, but we started to showing some of these in our exhibitions. This is the, the second earliest. The earliest one is in Topkap Sarai. This is the second earliest Mahmal. Uh, the significance of Mahmal was not really anything as much religious. It was more political. Because when they were trying to take uh, the setara to, uh, to, 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 to Mecca, what they did, they put that on a camel. And all the dignitaries were behind it to announce that we are taking the setara to Mecca. So that is the significance of it. What I always say, and here, these roundels, we are lucky to have, uh, in actual fact, uh, two sets of them. It's the name of Allah, Muhammad, Abu Bak, Omar, Usman, Ali, all six. And we have two sets of them. One set which is round and one set which is a square. We are lending some of these to the next exhibition in Abu Dhabi of Hajj. This is uh, one of the earliest coins of uh, uh, Hajj, which uh, was uh, minted in 105 in uh, Mecca. This is uh, a beautiful um, uh, medal. On one side it has Mecca, and on the other side it has Medina, it's in gold. Uh, it was probably made as a, as, as a gift by the order of somebody uh, in, 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 in Hajj. We're now coming to the Aramaic section. Uh, as a Jew, I decided that I've done so much for Islam that I don't want to be accused that I'm not doing anything for anybody else, which is the wrong way of looking at it. But I was very uh, fortunate to come across this group. Uh, there are only two groups of them, of these Aramaic uh, documents. One is in Bodhidan Library, and one is the other group is with us. So uh, I got permission from Bodhidan Library, and I'm, this, this book is published. And I'm uh, publishing all of theirs alongside ours. So this one is um, from the Darius III, which allegedly is uh, supposed to be the husband of Esther which is one of the greatest uh, the history of, uh, of Judaism. This is the time that uh, there was a conspiracy and the Persian king was supposed to kill all the Jews in the territory. And the Jewish wife stopped him. And after the Old Testament, the Begilat Esther, the story of Esther, is the, most, uh, the second most sacred story in Judaism. So this is uh, one of the sticks. Uh, the significance of that was that they were delivering uh, the food or, or, or wheat or whatever it was to the, to the palace. And each time the delivery came, they cut a small piece and made the, made, made, made the point that today there was a delivery done. And on the other side, when they came back, again, they chopped it. So they had the number of the deliveries coming to the palace. This is a letter from one Bactrian king to another. And uh, on one of these documents, you see the name of uh, Alexander the Great. His name was not Alexander, his name was Alexandrus. So if you, say, you see his name in Aramaic, Alexandrus. And don't forget that that was the language of Moses, Jesus. And that is how he spoke to his, uh, to his disciple. And till the day Jesus was crucified, he used to be called a Hebrew rabbi. And this is the language that he spoke, Aramaic. So uh, we are very lucky that uh, we have two of the greatest academics uh, in, in Jerusalem. It took them seven years to write uh, this book. And one of them passed away, Professor Nave. And I heard from Professor Shaket, the other author, that he turned around and said, at least I left the legacy behind. Meiji art. 
People ask me, why did you collect mage yards? For a simple reason. Van Gogh, in, his one, in one of his letters to his brother Theo, said, in a way, all my work is based on Japanese art. The significance and magnificence of this art is almost unparalleled. Uh, the first exhibition we gave was in 1994 at the British Museum, and simultaneously, a part of it, which was porcelain, was uh, shown at uh, a museum in Wales. It was opened by the Prince of Wales. Uh, here I'm showing you uh, just some examples. Uh, these samurais, usually when we have exhibition, we show them at the door and we say, these are the guardians of the exhibition. So we joked around. Uh, this is the close-up of it. It's uh, gold inlaid on, uh, on metal. These artists, whenever there was an exhibition, and this is again something extremely interesting to know, whenever there was exhibition, those days they used to have expositions in, in France, in London, in Chicago, the number of the visitors, if I tell you, you would, you, would, you, would, you would say that it is impossible, but it's not impossible, it's all recorded. The one in Paris at the time, in, uh, in about 18, 84, 83, when the population of France was no more than 20 million, the exhibition with Japanese uh, attracted close to 50 million visitors. So Japanism was extremely hot. The cabinet you see was uh, given in 1921 by the Crown Prince of Japan in his visit to London to uh, Edward VIII. Uh, it was in the palace for years. Seven artists were responsible to make this uh, cabinet. Uh, in, in 1936, the palace decided that it was too difficult to look after lacquer. They gave it to Christie. We have the letter from the Buckingham Palace that it was given to Christie's. Uh, Christie's sold it, not to us, to somebody else, and we were lucky to have it. So it's, it's a great piece of uh, Japanese lacquer. Uh, this is a huge uh, piece of uh, part of a garniture of tree. Uh, this is a centerpiece. I woke up at 2 o'clock in the morning to buy it in the sale in Japan because it was in a museum for about 30 years, and then the family took it and they were selling it. It comes in three pieces. That's one in the middle, and there are two vases on the left and the right. We have one of the vases, and funnily enough, we discovered that the other vase is in uh, San Francisco in a chain of Italian restaurants. We are trying to buy it of them, and each time we go to them, they say, buy the company, and you could have the voice. <laughs> <laughs> we decided that we would give um, an exhibition of um, uh, our Japanese pieces in Van Gogh Museum for the same reason that he said, in a way, all my work is based on Japanese art. And the first thing he ever, ever purchased between himself and uh, his brother, Theo, he didn't have much money, was a small Japanese enamel vase that was given to their mother for her birthday present. We exhibited that, which is our, which that piece is already in, in, in Van Gogh. So we put 36 of his paintings alongside uh, uh, about 200 of our pieces. Uh, the same time as the main exhibition in, 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 in Amsterdam. Uh, and they told us afterward that usually those three months brings in about 160,000 uh, visitors. For these exhibitions, they had uh, 320,000 visitors because it was a, a, a sort of a, a challenge to them to see why Van Gogh turns around and says, in a way, all my work is based on Japanese art. So that was, and you see the, the, the Van Gogh painting next to it. Uh, there are 27 Fabergé eggs. One is missing. There's supposed to be 28. We don't know what number 28 is, but the other 26 are all allocated. Uh, this is the only Japanese egg that we know of. It's almost five times bigger. We have uh, a few uh, of uh, so we have Fabergé pieces, but about 80 pieces in our enamel collection. You see some of them in a minute. Uh, but again, these are considered uh, the treasure of Japan. The same as this. This was, by the way, the post, uh, uh, poster of the British Museum exhibition. And the, the title was, it's an art that can never be repeated again. Because what these artists produced, it's just phenomenal. When we had the exhibition at the British Museum, uh, our curator, I'm not naming him, he had a bit of uh, too much uh, drink, and the ambassador and cultural attaché of Japan came especially to see the exhibition. So um, he turned around uh, to one of them, and he was, was looking at one of the pieces, and he said, this is incredible how my ancestor made pieces like that. And Victor turned around to uh, the, 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 the cultural uh, attaché and said, I bet Jesus was sitting next to them helping. <laughs> Uh, this is considered to be one of the greatest 19th century pieces of bronze in the world. Uh, we have a lot of uh, pieces in our Japanese collection. We lend one to the bronze uh, exhibition at the Royal Academy. 
and the Royal Academy exhibition got tremendous amount of uh, press, but there was always a small complaint. They were saying, why didn't you borrow more Japanese you know, uh, uh, bronzes? <laughs> why only one? Because we only gave them one at the time. Uh, these are uh, the, the porcelain from the same period, Meiji period, which is 1968-1912. Uh, 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 these are three potteries from that period. As you see in the middle, it's like it's woven, but it is not. It's, 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 it's all made out of pottery. They were real masters. When I was uh, showing uh, the one on the right with the fish to Prince Charles, because I gave him the tour of the exhibition, he said, I have similar koi in my pond. Can I touch it? I said, Your Highness, you can't touch it, but you cannot have the piece. Touching is okay, but not having the piece. So that was a joke between me and him. I'm showing you four photographs. Challenge me. Do you think these are photographs? Yes or no? Okay, this is another part of the artistic ability of uh, the Japanese artists. These are silk embroideries. And we have about 100 of them because I decided that I'm going to go for as many as I can find. Uh, they sometimes took uh, paintings of uh, different type and uh, copied it. We own a, a very big collection of kimono. We are, I'm showing you three different types, Edo period, Meiji period, and later period, which is Taishu period. Swedish textile, it's another story. We had a Swedish claim, a claim that we thought it was Islamic. There was a friend of ours, uh, Doris Blau, in town. We called him in. We called her in. We showed her the piece. She said, this is nothing to do with Islam. This is Swedish. I asked her how many pieces she has. She said, 30, 40. I bought the 30, 40 pieces, built up upon it. We have a collection of about 100. The, the, it's published, and the book has been out for about 20 years. This is another piece, and this is another piece. This is very much Islamic, in actual fact. The design is very Islamic. Uh, this is the metal work, the Zuluaga, the exhibition we gave was at uh, Victor Albert Museum. Uh, Morrison, Lord Morrison, was one of the biggest uh, sponsor of this artist. Uh, the family were painters and uh, inlaid the masters for the court of uh, Spain. Um, we have about 100 pieces all in. In whole of Spain, we have probably about 30, 40 pieces. And the second largest piece after uh, the piece that he made for the burial, for, 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 the, for the tomb of uh, Philip, this is the second largest piece we have. This is another piece which has enamel. This is very large. This is almost uh, one meter 60. And again, gold and silver inlay. I brought that in because um, uh, he was inspired by uh, Alhambra vases and the, the, the pair of vases that we have, you see, as you see it on the right, is, was his inspiration. Um, a lot of these objects uh, have a writing on them inlaid, which says, La Galib Elah Illallah, victory belongs to God, which is a very nasty piece because they ruled Spain for almost 300 years. Uh, enamel of the world, uh, this starts with the uh, Chinese. I'm showing you uh, eight panels uh, where I ask Anna to catalog them at the V&A because we had about 10 people, 12 people writing our book, including Titania Fabergé. She said, I'm not cataloging these. These are, uh, these are the, the, the treasure of uh, China. I had to go back to the dealer, find out the history of it, give them the documentation for them to catalog it for us. It has been exhibited, and the, the exhibition was at Hermitage about four or five years ago the exhibition of enamel with Hermitage, and, uh, and even Putin went to see it. You like him or not, but he did. A story of this is very interesting too. I was in Paris um, visiting uh, my family. Uh, a friend of mine said to me, you're decorating your house. Uh, I understand your wife is interested in uh, uh, 1940s, 1930s and stuff. Let's go to Didi Aaron, and maybe you find something there. I'll walk in. I see this table on the floor. I couldn't believe that it could be genuine. I turned around to him and I said, how the heck am I going to find out if it is genuine or not? So I turned around and I said, I understand you have very good cappuccino or, uh, or espresso here to the owner, to the Aaron. He passed away, God bless his soul. As he went to get the, the, the coffee, I quickly turned the table to see if I could see the name and the signature of, of, of the imperial court. And I knew that I'm on the right track. So we bought it. And again, there are only two in the world. One is in, in, in China, and this is the second one. This one is absolutely mint, mint condition. A Fabergé clock. So this is, again, part of the enamel collection. The story of this is very interesting, too. 
uh, it was being just about to be sold at Christie's as a porcelain. And the, the gentleman was running down to go to another department and saw that uh, amongst the other pieces, they said, what this enamel is doing here? They said, this is not enamel, this is uh, porcelain. They said, no, 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 it is not. They opened the back of it, they found out it's uh, uh, 18th century, very rare, and I made the close up to show you that it's like a Dutch painting when you blow it up and it's enamel. Uh, we have two of these chargers. This is 16 and a half kilos. It was given to the president of uh, France. We are lucky to be uh, uh, the temporary custodian, as I always say, not the owner. I hate the, the name owner. Um, so we have the two. I'm showing you the one which is St. George's. It's by uh, Ofchinikov, one of the masters. Uh, in 1972, uh, I was visiting New York. I walked into a shop, silver shop, and I saw hundreds of pieces on the floor. I said, what is this? They said, this is part of a, a wine system. I looked, and there were lucky jewelry pieces on, 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 on the ground. To cut the long story short, I bought it in 1992. It was sitting in our warehouse for almost 35 years. And when we decided to put our collection together, it's 3,600 ounces of silver, gold, and enamel. This one is interesting to uh, see. We lent that to the exhibition of Indian exhibition at the Victor Albert Museum. It traveled throughout uh, Europe. Uh, Anna wrote a letter to me. She's, she's sitting here somewhere. She's been helping us uh, a lot with our, uh, with our Japanese. Uh, she's a fantastic academic. Um, a lot of people who were visiting the exhibition were going to this piece first because it's almost, it weighs almost a ton of iron, silver, enamel, and partly gilt. Uh, I'm showing you just part of our publication. As you heard, uh, by the time we finish, we'll end up with uh, 90 volumes. Uh, I'm showing you uh, some of the Japanese nine volumes, some of the other uh, catalogs. They're all out, except, except uh, uh, the remaining of the Islamic. All the others are uh, out. And these are some of the posters that each time we have exhibitions, uh, we'll uh, use for... Uh, uh, publicity purposes for people to come see the exhibition. And this is, uh, as I said, I put you on the right, on, on a fast track. Uh, if you are interested and if you are inspired to see what these magnificent artists have done, reserve your praises for the soul of the artist who have produced this object, not for me. God bless you. Thank you. Lily, David, um, thank you very much indeed. Pleasure. What an absolute uh, tour de force. Uh, David promised he would do it in an hour, and I have to tell you, I didn't believe him. Um, <laughs> and you did. So, um, promised thank you, you. Thank you so much, <laughs> because there were 86 slides, for those of you who weren't uh, counting. Um, David, I also wanted to thank you personally for the huge commitment and support you've shown us here at uh, SOAS. Um, for the work that we do, uh, for the robust debate uh, that we have uh, here as uh, a school. It's not always an easy place uh, no, it's not. to be. We know that. <laughs> <laughs> um, and we sometimes give you a very hard time. Doesn't um, matter. So we thank you a huge amount yes. uh, for that uh, continued support. And those of you who have been able to visit uh, our new building, uh, our new wing, the Paul Webley Wing, I hope you saw the absolutely wonderful bronze incense burner, uh, which was made by the imperial court artist, Suzuki Masayoshi of uh, Tokyo, which adorns our cloisters in the Paul Webley wing. Uh, and again, that was very uh, generously loaned to us uh, by Professor Kalili. She so, deserved much more, by the way. <laughs> so, um, thank you very much. And tonight is not just about recognizing you, David, as an art collector. It's also about the work that you have done in promoting uh, peace and uh, interfaith um, across uh, the world. And we very much uh, want to thank you uh, for that. Uh, can we also, everyone should have received a copy of 
the Khalili collections. Um, I have to tell you that that's been very generously donated by uh, David as well. And if you didn't collect one on the way in, please uh, collect one on the way out. We don't have time for questions now, but we are all invited upstairs for a reception. Don't mob David too much. Uh -huh. um, yeah. Thank him very much for tonight, but also for hosting the wonderful food you're going to experience uh, when uh, you go upstairs. Thank you again. Pleasure. That was absolutely Pleasure.